And we are live here in the Storycraft Cafe. I am your host, Hank Garner. Uh, today, super excited to have Jim Butcher joining us on the show. Jim, if well, you know, if you are familiar with fantasy literature at all, then you know Jim. He needs no introduction, but he is the author of seventeen uh, Dresden Files novels at this point. Six books in the Codex Alera, and now the second book in the Cinder Spire series, the much anticipated and awaited The Olympian Affair. It comes out this fall. Uh, I have had a chance to read it. It is amazing. Uh, Jim, we talked a few years ago when the first Cinder Spires book came out, The Aeronauts Windless. And, you know, a lot of people have been anxious for this second book. Um, how how has the writing been going and uh what do you hope to bring to the reading audience with the second book in the cinder spires well i've i've, I've been on a tear lately uh <laughs> i got to the point where i was thinking about abandoning the series because you know i wasn't sure there was a lot of interest in it and you know i was sort of fumbling around with my with my career trying to decide where to focus my energy next and uh, uh i wound up going to dragon con last year and i and i had a dozen different readers come up separately and say, when's the next book in the Cinder Spire is going to come out? I really want to know what happens to these people. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't let them down. Uh, <laughs> so I came back from that and started hammering on it every night and, uh, uh, and really, you know, kind of got back into my groove and got that done. Um, and I got that hammered out and then did a novella that's going to come out uh, uh, a month ahead of time. You know, so some additional story for people who might not have seen enough of one of the characters and they, you know, they were asking for more. And uh, uh, and then I got you know, straight to work on the next Dresden. That's about a quarter done. And I, I anticipate having that done before Christmas. Well, Dragon Con uh, usually is late August, early September. Yep. Um, so if you started getting, you know, request for the second Cinder Spires last year, Dragon Con, that's just about a year ago. Did did the whole book come about in this past year? Did you have part of it already written? I think I had about 12 chapters already done and sort of I got to the beginning and then you get to that middle part where you're not quite sure what comes next next and it gets sticky and a lot, it, it gets hard to write the book when you get to the middle. And uh, I had got the, the beginning was easy and I got that out of the way and I got to the middle and just sort of bogged down. But at that point, it's like, well, I, I got to get to work. There's too many people who are you know looking forward to reading this. So. That's awesome. Um, before we get into, you know, some really uh, deep conversation, I do have a question for you. Dresden has a dog, Mouse, um, with superior intellect and dexterity. The Center Spires has talking cats. Um which is better dogs, cats. Uh, I, I feel like that you used to have a different opinion about this, but in the last, you know, decade or, or, or less, maybe your opinion has changed. Oh, I started living with more cats. <laughs> and my, my ex had, had uh, three main coons. And uh, uh, so I got to live with them and they're, they're wonderful cats. They're, they're, they're very social, you know. They always want to be hanging out wherever you are, and they're they're super snuggly. And uh, and then uh, I, we adopted a cat who just sort of wandered in off the street. Uh, I think maybe the cat adopted us, but you know, he just got to a point where he, I would lay down on the couch, and he would just lay down on my chest and stick his head under my chin. And it's like, okay, buddy, uh, <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'm officially your human. So uh, uh, so he's still he's still with me. That's Ben Ress. Um, and then he he weighs about he weighs about five and a half pounds. I've got a ninety five pound pit bull uh, named Brutus, and uh, Fen just bosses Brew around as long as the all day long. You know, he'll just come over and Brew will be laying on his dog bed, and Fen will come over and kick him off the bed, and then curl up and go to sleep in the middle. So I've got this huge bed made for a hundred pound pit bull, and just a little five pound cat curled up in a little you know just a little ball in the center of it. It's it's kind of hilarious, but. Uh, uh, I think it's, I think it depends on the situation. You know what situation are you in? Uh, the dog is a lot better at going outside and, and going hiking with you and stuff like that. I think. I mean, there are some cats that are good at it. Don't get me wrong, but Fenris is not one of those cats. When I take Fenris outside. He's walking and I'm following him around places. You know that that's. <laughs> uh, but you know, Brew is much better for for going outside. If you want to if you want to go and, and play, I think Brew is superior at playing. Uh, but Fenris is just so much more convenient to snuggle. 
and uh, often I, I have them both like on my like physically touching me at the same time. You know, I'll have Ben <laughs> lap and brew with his chin on my knee, and both of them asleep, and they both snore. Uh, although, you know, Brutus is way better at snoring. I got to give him that. Yeah. You have created some of the most interesting, dynamic characters in in all of fiction. Um, have you ever had a character that you created or came to you, you know, however characters uh, exist, um, that you thought would be an epic character no matter what the plot is? Or have you had an idea for a plot that would be epic and amazing no matter what characters you cast in that plot? I don't think there's such a thing as a plot that is epic with lame characters. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that just, that just doesn't fly. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that said, you don't have to be Superman to be epic, you know? Yeah. Uh, but um, characters are, or what character is one of the things that I think gets dropped way too often uh, uh, in service to plot. I mean, you, you, we've all, you know, we've all seen shows or, or, or movies or read stories where it's like, well, I'm not quite sure why this is happening. And then you kind of think about it and you go, well, it's happening because the plot needs it to happen. And uh, uh, when you're doing your character properly, you never run into that problem because your character is driving the story uh, uh, and, and you can, you can follow them. Um, you know, they, they tend, they, they tend to act. I don't want to say the characters all act rationally because they don't, they don't always act rationally, but they act understandably. They act human. Uh, uh, unless you're writing particularly in the ones, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I, I mean, I've got a lot of stories that I want to tell. I'm, at, at my current rate of production, I'll have to live to be 128 to tell the ones <laughs> that I've, that I've got in mind now, uh, right. uh, you know, much less the ones that are coming, you know, th that will come to me in the future. But, uh, the ones I came up with when I, the stories, the, the core stories I came up with when I was younger, I, I really like. Uh, I think there's a lot of dynamism to them that, you know, I, I had a lot more energy then. <laughs> and I think the stories are, are planned out pretty well and I've done really well with them. So I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to mess with success, but I, you know, I've got several other stories I want to write. I've got my, uh, my science fiction series, uh, which is basically X men meets men in black on the moon, uh, uh about 200 years in the future. And, uh, I, which I really want to get done. That's called the U S Marshals. Uh, I've got, uh, an epic fantasy series that I want to write that is, you know, kind of fantasy Incredibles uh, that I want to do. And uh, we'll just have to see, you know, how things turn out. Uh, uh, but, I've been, but I've got all kinds of ideas and stuff that I want to do, but, you know, I, I didn't really, this whole Dresden thing got completely out of hand. <laughs> well, speaking of that epic, epic fantasy series, you've, you've threatened for years that you're going to write this epic, epic fantasy series. Yeah, when, um, I'm, and that, up, when I'm a grown up. Yeah. And that every fantasy writer, you know, secretly wants to write an epic, epic fantasy series. What, what is the allure of of the epic, epic fantasy series? And, you know, what what, what is the draw of of writing that that kind of series? And, and what kind of weight does that sort of series carry over, you know, what we consider market fiction and is is there something more weighty to epic fantasy okay let me let me address the first part of the question first which okay is, what's the what is the the draw to it for me as a writer uh, i want to address that first um and that just is you know i mean i started my life with grandpa tolkien you know i, yeah. I, I you remember the box set that you got at the at the, at the, at the book fair with the with the red yellow the, and blue i had that same set yeah, yeah exactly yeah when it was just about the only fantasy out there, there was that and Elf Stones, and a little bit later, uh, 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 the drag the, the dragon books uh, uh, that Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman did. Right, uh, the Dragonlands. Uh, Dragonlands. Yes, yeah. thank you. And, and 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 other than that, you know, there was that, and there, and Gary Gygax was writing some books and stuff like that. But you know, Tolkien was the was the master. He was the well, right. this is this is the model, and. You know, I, 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 I always wanted that. I wanted Tolkien, but with more testosterone. You know, that was sort of a, what, what I sort of wanted more of it in. I wanted more Aragorn out of Tolkien. You know, uh, I wanted more, you know, I wanted to see more of the, of the dramatic, cool confrontation. Uh, uh, I wanted to see Gandalf be not so subtle. 
you know, uh, <laughs> and, and which is partly where the Dresden Files came from. Uh, but, you know, you sort of looked at that and you read these books and especially if you read them young and, and you know, I, started, I, I read them first when I was eight and then I read them again when I was 10 and it was a completely different story. And again, when I was 15, it was a completely different story. And again, when I was, you know, 20, 25, 40, you know, I mean, you, you see the different things that are in it as you, as you get older and as you, as you gain more perspective. And, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to write something that was like that, something that could be you know, a series that could be a companion for people for a long time, um, uh, uh, which is one of the, which is, and that segues pretty neatly into the commercial reason of why you, why you write epic fantasy. Fantasy books have legs. I mean, you can write a fantasy story and because it's not connected to our world, you know, because it is not you know, focused upon about, upon certain events or, or, or certain philosophies or, cert, or, or certain uh, 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 politics, you know, you can write those books and uh, about just classic principles and things that stand over time. And as a result, those books stay in print forever. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and that's one of the, I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the great things about them. You know, I wrote uh, the Alara series, which is the fantasy series that I wrote, uh, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, right? they, they started coming out not too long after Dresden. And those things are still, I mean, those they're, they're still selling. They're still making me money. And, and I, I feel good about that. Uh, uh, fantasy is a very good genre to be in if you want to have books in print for a long time. Yeah, uh, a lot of mystery and thrillers that are, are set in the, uh, in, in the current time with current... Um, yeah, politics and uh, you know all of the window especially, dressing. Especially Th those current, things age. Yeah, especially current tech because yes. tech seems so fast. You know. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and that's probably why you're seeing more and more mystery thrillers that are set back in the '80s and and '70s even uh, because you know once you have a, a supercomputer in your pocket, you know there's there there's a whole yeah. lot of plots that just kind of fall apart. Google does so much to ruin fantasy. Yeah. yeah. Or to ruin and, history, that is. Yeah, uh, and the ability to send a text. Hey, yeah. get me out of this locked room, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I, I still remember the skits online where, you know, or, or I think it was one of the animated movies where the Riddler was up to something and uh, Waller was on the other end of the line and the, the Riddler asks her a riddle and she answers him and he, he's like, did you, have you already heard that one? And she says, no, I have Google, like everyone else. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, that does kind of ruin the Riddler in a lot of ways. He's really going to have to adapt, you know, for the new world. Oh, that's that's hilarious. Uh, speaking of Codex Alera, um, you started. Uh, did you start writing that after Dresden? Uh, they they were pretty close, weren't they? I wrote the first two Dresden books, and before they were sold, I started the first Alera book. Okay, um, gotcha. I wrote I wrote that book, the first book in that series, uh, and that was already done by the time. Uh, I started on the third Dresden and, and there were just there, the first, my first contract, I was lucky. I got a three book contract for, with my first one. And so I sold those first three Dresden books and I had, I had gotten number four done and, and proved that I could, you know, that I could write on, on, on a schedule. And then they were like, well, let's see your fan. And I started working on that. And I think, I think I finally got that one sold uh, about the time the seventh Dresden book came out. How did having two series to work on help you creatively um, to kind of keep from going crazy? Because you went very deep, very quickly on Dresden. I mean, we're up to book 17 now. Um, you know, as a creative person, that has to be draining at some point to live in this world constantly with these characters you, you need a break. You need uh, other ways to stretch your creative muscles. Yes, um, especially from Dresden. He's sort yeah. of having that really high energy roommate, you know, and, and, yeah. you know, and, and, and when you're, when you're, when you're doing, when you're doing stuff and you're doing active stuff, it's great. But you know, when he's just sort of bouncing around the inside of my head, you know, while well, I'm, I'm like, listen, you don't stop giving me new ideas. I'm, I'm trying to get this one finished. You know, that, that gets, that gets wearisome after a while. Uh, uh, so being able to cut over to those fantasy books, you know, which were written first person, they were written third person, and that that's a very different form of storytelling. You know, when you're writing everything from an I me perspective, you know, you know 
how you're going to do 90% of the job because it's all got to be from this character's perspective and the way they experience it. And it's also very good for making sure your, your story follows logically from one chapter to the next. Uh, but when you switch over to the third person perspective, you have so many more choices. And I like to say so much more rope with which you can hang yourself. And uh, uh, it's a harder story to write. Uh, I think ultimately it's more possible from the third person perspective. Um, uh, uh, it's not my it's not my first area of skill, but I like to work on it because you know I think you should you know you should work your weaker areas to make it stronger. Uh, uh, but by the time I by the time I'm done with the Dresden book, I'm like, oh, get me out of this guy's perspective. Let me see you know, let, me, let me see a different world. And you know I go to the third person perspective, and I got all these different characters to juggle in, in Codex Alera or, or in, uh, uh, in well not Codex Alera, in Codex Alera. But, also now in the Cinder Spires books. Right. By the time I get done, you know, with this act, then I'm like, oh my gosh, get me away from all these people with all their different concerns and perspectives and let me just get back in the saddle with Dresden. Good to see you, buddy. Like that, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's it's one of those things where, you know, the grass is always greener and you kind of enjoy switching from one project to the other. And and hopefully I, I can get my yeah, I can get my writing my writing down disciplined enough that I can start getting I can start getting uh, uh, a couple of books done a year and then at least part of another project so that I'll have some more stuff coming, you know, in, in future years. Um, uh, I, I've been, I've been on, I won't say a hiatus, but I haven't been nearly as productive the past several years and I'm turning that around now. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Well, speaking of writing in the first person perspective and, uh, Dresden specifically, they always say that as a writer, you write yourself into uh, your books. Rarely do do readers uh, pick up all the places where you come through the characters. What what people think? Oh, this is this is Jim writing himself into the. It rarely is what people think. It's usually the the other places where pieces of you come out. Um, Dresden is. Um, is a very unique character and let me just say it like that uh and he has some very specific views on the world and the people around him when when writing a character in first person like that for so long um it is it difficult to remove yourself from dresden and to allow him to be the the creature of his place and time that's not Jim Butcher, like, do you ever find yourself bleeding over into Dresden or him into you, and you have to step back and think, I am, I am not the characters that I create. I think there's more, more of an issue in a lot of ways. Dresden is who I would like to be if I had the kind of power that he has access to. Sure, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not at all confident that I would be that person. <laughs> um, but but in a lot of ways, he's who I'd like to be. And uh, uh, so, if anything, I think Dresden bleeds a little bit more into my life than the other way around. Um, that said, though, I mean, Dresden is one of the characters I role play. You know, I mean, I, I do I do a lot of live action role play. I do a lot of tabletop gaming. Uh, uh, you know, where I play different characters, and I try and play people who are who are very different than me. Um, Dresden is. Um, you know, he's, he's kind of a lot of my video gamer side in real life. And, uh, 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 and other than that, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I keep getting told, ah, just you. And I, and I, and I kind of stop and think about that and go, well, I suppose he is. I mean, so is everybody else, you know? So if Dresden me, then that also means that Mab is me and Marcone is me and, you know, so on. But, right. uh, uh, you know, I, I guess we all contain multitudes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you told me one time that Codex Alera was a nod to Hornblower, if I remember right. No, that, that's, that, that's the new one. The new one is a that, Hornblower. That, that was, uh, what, what were some of the themes of Hornblower that, that you wanted to explore in this book? And, and why, why was it important to you to, to kind of go down this road? Well, Codex Alera, the, the hornblower aspect of that one was the the idea of the progression of the main character, the central character. Yeah, the character starts off, you know, in in, in Shepherd Boy's Fury, and you know, then he, then he moves on up to act. He, he becomes an academic at the academy, you know, and and as he progresses through life, that's how each book is titled, and that was something that Hornblower did as well. And and that story is all it's it's a coming of age story. It's how you turn into an adult. 
yeah. uh, uh, and how he becomes a, a you know a responsible and 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 active member of his society. Um, as far as Codex Alera go, or, or excuse me, as far as the Cinder Spires goes, um, I'm taking aspects of Hornblower where uh, the character there are a lot of characters who are dealing with aspects of honor and how do you how do you behave responsibly and honorably when you're put into these situations where you have conflicts of interest and where you know perhaps your your, your basic humanity has to be compared against your loyalty to you know, to your home uh, uh or where uh, uh you know you're you're going to have to decide what kind of sacrifice has to be made and how much you're willing to give up um in this particular one, there's also some duels, which I love. I, I love writing duels because there are so many. Uh, well, one because I grew up on Star Wars, and the duels were the center of those stories. Oh yeah, and I always felt that the original Star Wars trilogy that the duels were really just an excuse to have a confrontation of philosophies. You know, I mean, there was a lot of that going on during the duels in Star Wars. There was a lot of talking happening, and uh, uh, I enjoy writing it for that same reason. It's the, Show these diff- these different uh, viewpoints in life coming into you know coming into direct confrontation with each other and you know, how does that turn out what does that mean um, so there's a lot of that built into horn there, there's a lot of that hornblower stuff built into uh, 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 the cinder spire just because you know, one of the central characters is you know literally a ship uh, uh, who has to decide all these things on his own you know kind of away from his uh, 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 center of civilization and you know how does he you know, how does he make his calls? How does he make his decisions? Um, which is more important to him, his personal honor or, or, or you know, his loyalty to, you know, to, to his uh, essentially feudal lord? And I have a great deal of fun, you know, playing with that, and coming up with situations in the middle of that. And I love having the cats around because the cats can, can are always there to point out the essential human absurdities in any given situation. You know, and that's a lot of fun as well. Yeah, the the cats are are really interesting, especially from uh, from the perspective of reading a lot of Dresden Files, where um, it, you know different subgenre of fantasy, um, where Dresden is um, very much rooted and grounded in the real world, uh, and then the fantastical characters that kind of fill out the world. Whereas this world of, of the Cinder Spires, kind of all bets are off. I, anything can happen because we're not kind of rooting and, and grounding in the real world like right. like we do in urban fantasy. Um, as a writer, do, does that um, w- what does that do for the way you see the world and and how the the story of that world unfolds? Knowing that that anything is possible, you've kind of removed the the rules as it were well i don't think i've removed the rules as much as i've removed all the familiar touchstones that we're all used to okay we just make we just make regular associations you know when i'm when i'm writing the dresden files i can say they were in a walmart and everybody goes ah yeah i've been in one of those i know what that looks like saves me so much work right you are in you know when you are in this you know completely alien society on this planet where they have to exist under much different circumstances than, than than we do in our world um you know, you've got to do all the work. You've got to do all the lifting. You've got to do make sure you've got all the sets, you know, lined up yourself. You know, you've got to make sure you you get the right mood for everything that's happening. You, you can't lean on anything that is a common experience uh, um, in terms of environment for 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 the reader to, to go with. You, know, you have to give the reader everything that they need to be able to have that personal experience of what the characters are going through in that moment and in that place. You know, you have to provide them with just enough for their imaginations to grab onto and go, Oh my gosh, that would be horrifying. Or that's hilarious. You know, you know, you're doing well when you're, when you do world building and you can make a joke that is very specific to your world uh, uh, and, and have people enjoy it, you know, which is a joke that just wouldn't work anywhere else. We've got uh, a couple of comments that have come in. Um, Hey Jim, looking forward to meeting you at fantasy festival in Denmark in September. I hope to talk to you a few minutes about Pathfinder after your Q and A. Um, what what's your favorite uh, role playing game, and uh, and why is it Pathfinder? 
<laughs> uh, I admire Pathfinder because I think Paizo has been just so astute in their business process. You know, it's like when fourth edition came out and D&D radically changed from what it had been before to kind of a more World of Warcrafty kind of game. Uh, Paizo went, you know what? Let's let's have some more. This is tr let's have some more tradition. We'll go with, we'll go with D and D for the people who still want that. And they went they they leaned heavy into that, and uh, and that's when they really exploded, you know, as a game system. Um, I enjoy the hell out of Pathfinder. I've just started a game where I'm doing second edition Pathfinder, uh, uh, with different uh, character action and so on. It's a very, it's a very different place to, to run, you know, to run tactical combat, which, you know, that's a lot. That's half the game is tactical combat, and the other half is the role-playing stuff that happens between them. Um, uh, uh, I've been having a great time uh, uh, doing that. I, I really do enjoy the hell out of Pathfinder. I've looked at the, you know, I've done, I've done a little bit of D&D &D, uh, 5th edition, but um, it hasn't been, it hasn't been as favorite. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll always go back to D&D &D because it's, you know, it's the original game system I grew up under, but I started with first edition D and D. In fact, I started with expert D and D, you know, before advanced. D &D. And uh, uh, so it's, you know, it's it, it's 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 going to have it's going to have my heart always just to some degree. But I'm really enjoying running, running Pathfinder. My favorite system to one run though is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay because it's just so dark. And <laughs> you can run the grim dark stuff, and when you're doing the grim dark stuff, and then you throw the humor in to, to lighten things up, I think everybody has a, has, has a much better time. And uh, I, I will have fun. I will always have fond memories of my college years where I ran Warhammer relentlessly. Nice, nice. You, the life of a novelist can be um, very um, uh, lonely, uh, if you will, um, because you know, for the most part, you're sitting in a room alone telling stories and you know later in the process when when editors and proofreaders and the rest of publishing comes in it becomes more of a cooperative thing but for the vast majority of the process it's just you and and a keyboard um role-playing games are really cooperative storytelling when it when it comes down to it um does having that outlet uh, feed you creatively and does that give you an opportunity to you know not just be the crazy guy in in the room with his keyboard yeah well when i'm writing i'm essentially playing D D with myself you know and i'm the only one there and i have to play be the gm and all the characters and uh, uh that's not nearly as much fun as when i'm at a table with people and the you know the banter is going back and forth and we're having a good time with it um I play a lot with my sons, and and my sons have very little respect for me uh, when it comes when it comes to the gaming table. You know, they they, they enjoy having a, a very merely adversarial game, and you know, I, there's lots of quips and, and insults flowing, and, and we have a great time together. Um, uh, uh, that said, yeah, the writing part can be real lonely. It's great to. Uh, it's great for my, my ability as a writer and for my own personal imagination to be working with other people because unlike the characters that, that I write, they never do what I, the players, they just never do what I want them to do. And so I, I find myself, they, they go off in a totally different direction than where they're supposed to go. And I find myself frantically building this world six inches in front of their toes as they, as they, charge, it, as they charge ahead full speed. And uh, uh, that I think that's a very good exercise to build up your imagination and to build up and to figure out how to build up a, a coherent world. Uh, and so I, I practice that over and over. I'm always running different campaigns in different you know different planetary you know settings and so on. So one campaign will be uh, uh, you know it will be based around a race through essentially Africa. Only it's D and D Africa, you know. Uh, and, you know, there'll be some going back and forth through all these environments, you know, racing against these other teams and having the problems that come up when you encounter them. The next campaign will be, you know, I'll run Keep on the Borderlands, except I'll run it during a zombie apocalypse. And the Keep is the, is the last human holdout place. And so the going off to the Kings of Chaos turns into a diplomatic mission to try and make contact with the Greenskins to unite against the undead, you know, and that changes everything completely. And, uh, you know, it, it is it is so much fun for me to create these different worlds with these different considerations, and then to you know then then, then to toss the people I love into them and see what happens. Man, um, 
Jim, over the the last decade, I've done uh, 1,500 or so author interviews, and there's there are two different types of people that I've discovered. One, uh, the the type of writer who writes novels if they don't succeed and find publishing, they scrap that novel, go to the next one, and and they kind of continue that process until either they become better writers or the market is more prepared for this book, whatever, you know, the case is. Uh, and then I've met a few who write a novel. It's not good enough. So they go back and they revise that novel and until it is good enough or until the market catches up to them, whatever the case is, but right. they focus on this one story. Um, I, I believe you've told me in the past that you wrote um, a few trunk novels that, that didn't see publication. Um, yeah. Do you ever consider going back to them? Do, do you ever have the idea? Oh, now I know why that story didn't work. Or uh, is it kind of like the, the story junkyard where you go out and, and rob a story for parts? Oh, yeah. I scrap them for parts. I absolutely scrap them for parts, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think four different story worlds, seven different novels that I wrote that, that um, just weren't – they just weren't doable. They were awful. I was learning. That, that's, how it, that's how it happens. You, you start off – in order to be good at something, first you have to suck at something and, and then yeah. work – you're better at it and then and then eventually you can be pretty good um and i and i feel like i've gotten to the point where i'm pretty good now but i think i can do better and you know so I'm, i continue to, to try and work on my skills and to work on my craft to be able to create better and better stories um those early books oh my gosh yeah they were they were a mess and they were a mess <laughs> because i didn't know you know there was so much i didn't know about the writing process that i couldn't know until i had written a whole book and then you know understood yeah. Oh wait a minute! You know, I, I forgot to build a foundation under this one, or yeah, I, I made this wall really great, but I forgot to put in a door, and now there's a place for this door to go, and you know that sort of thing. Um, you know, where I didn't leave things open enough, so there wasn't enough flexibility for me to tell different kind of stories or to really be able to play in that world. And and you know, as you learn more, you I think I could go back to some of them, and there's some of the some of the ones that are in the background that I think. Uh, uh, could be, you know, I'm going to be able to take that world and use it in the future, but I'm going to have to, you know, start the story in a completely different place with completely different characters and completely different villains, especially villains. You learn more and more about those as, as, as you keep writing, and they're they're so critical. And uh, uh, eventually, I'll be able to I'll be able to lift a bunch of the characters and a bunch of the situations from that past and be able to put it back together again. But uh, goodness, you know, it's like I, I had. You know this company of mercenaries that I wrote in an early book. That uh, uh, you know there was like fifteen of them, and I was trying to keep. I was trying to write all of these different characters, you know, and how they would interact right. and so on. And it, it it finally got to a point where it's just like, you know what, you you just can't handle that many. You're just not that good yet. You can't be that concise and that clear yet. And uh, uh, so you know, we'll we'll whittle these fifteen mercenaries down to one guy. Okay, that works a lot better. Then you move on from there. Yeah. Um, you've told the story before about your writing teacher and um, <laughs> how that that, you know, she tried to get through to you and you eventually decided to do it her way out of spite. And yeah. um, and that's what eventually became the Dresden Files um, yeah. was looking back now. Uh, was there any one piece of advice that wasn't getting through? your head that when you did it her way this was the thing that unlocked or was it just a you know scrapping everything you thought you knew following the process what what was it do you think that that you did differently that unlocked the thing that had been blocking you for me i was pretty good at writing i was pretty good at writing scenes and a scene is is any any, any uh, portion of your story where your character is actively pursuing a goal. And sometimes that goal is as simple as survive, and sometimes it's get information, and so on and so forth. But when your character is after that goal, you, they would, I, I could write that. And then there's, there's, some kind of, there's some kind of adversary that gets in the way, so there's conflict. And I was pretty good at writing those scenes. What I wasn't good at writing, what I learned that is really is most of writing, is you're right, it, writing 
the character's emotional reaction after you get out of those high tension situations. Those are those were those were called sequels, uh, not sequels as in follow ups, but sequels as in the next thing in the sequence. And the next thing in the sequence after you have these high stakes scenes where there's all this tension and all this action is showing how your character reacts to those. And when I started really studying the structure of sequels and understanding, okay, wait, there's a psychological process that everybody goes through after situations like that. You know, first that you know, first they, you know, the first your first reaction is always this emotional reaction. How do you handle that? And then you, you know, then then you can sort of bring reason in after you get your emotions under control, and then you can kind of review what happened and, and, and you know what what it means for you and and you know what what consequences are coming as a result of that. And then you decide where you're going next. And, and after you decide where you go next, that's what leads you into your next scene. And before I, and I had just not taken that seriously at all uh, when, I had, when I had been writing the class before. And when she, you know, when she finally said, hey, I really think you need to look at this and you really need to start showing a, a little bit more of, of how your characters are reacting to all these things that are going on, it's going to make them seem a lot more real and a lot more human. And it's going to be a lot more easy uh, for the readers to, to get behind it. Uh, and, uh, and that's basically, that was basically what really unlocked it. That's what really made the Dresden Files really roll along uh, for the first book that I wrote. Uh, because I'd written several short stories that were basically in that world with a different character, and the scenes were really great, but they just didn't grab anybody. I mean, they would they would say, "Yeah, I read it; it, it read easily and smoothly, and so on." But when I got to the end, I didn't really feel like there was any kind of emotional punch to it. And mm. the reason there wasn't was because I wasn't giving them anything to work with. Um, you know, that was on me. So I, I went back in, and like, okay, let me figure out how to add emotional punch. And it turns out the way you do that is by making your characters, you know react like human beings and to show people this is this is why i'm reacting to this 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 is what matters to my character this is what hurts especially this is what hurts. Uh, that that that's something that we can all identify with because we all feel pain yeah the legend of uh the dresden files uh goes that that she then said oh this is great what's next and you came back with a 20 you know book outline yeah um, yeah that yeah. you're she You're meant, still what, following to to a degree. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be more like twenty two books. Uh, okay, I've written a, a story, you know, an epic story, twenty books long before. Um, <laughs> so uh, my plan right now is, I think it's going to be about twenty two of the case books like we've had so far, and then and then a, a, just a big old double sized book, you know, trilogy to kind of capstone off the whole thing. Nice. Uh, and the trilogy is the trilogy is going to be titled. Um, uh, 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 stars and stones, hell's bells, and empty night. You know, there's a reason for all that. All those phrases are curses inside the Dresden Files world. And yes, I to bring that out later. Nice, nice. Well, well, being that you've been writing um, a series for two decades, uh, going off of this massive plan that you architected, you know, all those years ago, when you start a new series like Cinder Spires. Do you approach it in the same way where you have this grand architected plan and you're following or are you able to hold a plan for a series like that more loosely, give yourself a chance to stretch creatively in different ways, or are you a strict plan writer? Cinder Spires, uh, I, I wrote with breakpoints in it. So, it, so if it was if it was going well, then I then it, then I've got I've got a plan to finish it off after a trilogy. And if, if but if, if if it's not going well, you know it'll be it'll, it'll be three books long, and, it'll, and we can have a fulfilling trilogy out of that. Um, if uh, uh, if it's going better than that, then I've got a plan for six books, and I've also got a plan for nine books, uh, uh, just in case. Uh, and so we'll I'll, I'll be able to tell in the next book or so, you know how, how, which way I'm going to go with it. But I. Right now it's looking like six, but if enough people get behind it, I'm up for nine. Nice. Um, you've now published 17 Dresden Files books, six Codex Alera books, uh, a number of shorter pieces that fill in gaps along the way, uh, two Cinder Spires books, or the second Cinder Spires book comes out this fall. Um, how do you maintain uh, a balance between your author life in your real life, you know, you alluded uh, earlier uh, that 
you know, you'd kind of had a, a down spot for a couple of years and, and people keep asking, I think this was right before peace talks came out, you know, Jim, where's peace talks. When's it coming out? When's it, you promised, you promised, yeah. you know, that, and, and the more people say stuff like that, I would imagine that it just, you know, becomes, you know, and, and a number of other authors can attest to, you know, people really love this thing and they want more of it. And you're just one person and it all has to come out of your brain and through your fingers. And you know, that a person can only do what a person can, can do. Uh, how do you maintain a healthy work life balance so that you can continue to tell stories that people love without sacrificing your soul to do it? Well, First of all, let me say that no writer writes as fast as he wants to. He writes as fast as he can. Yeah. And if you, you know, if you just don't have the book, I mean, for me, I would rather, I would rather wait uh, until I had something that I thought was worthy to be read, you know, than, than just sort of dash a book out and say, there you go. everybody. Uh, and, and, you know, here, here's a book. It's the Jim Butcher formula. Enjoy. Anybody can do that. Um, uh, you know, when, when I, you know, Personally, I went through some personal things that were pretty rough, and I was learning how to how to, how to deal with those. And uh, it, it it took a while, you know. Not all not all life is easy, and sometimes it comes up and hits you in the face. And uh, which is actually what the, the new Dresden book is about uh, in a lot of ways. You know, it's about you know Dresden's had this huge epic battle, a bunch of Chicago got wiped out. You know, there's there's all kinds of problems that are going to come about as a result of that. And uh, uh, the book is is it's much about how do you get back up after you've been knocked down, you know, and, and there's all these other things happening too. You know, there's like a new Valkyrie bodyguard, he gets a new apprentice, you know, we've got this whole issue with Lara happening. But the book is it's more about how do you recover when life comes up and really really delivers something bad to you. And that's something that, that I think everybody's it's gonna resonate with a lot of people, especially after the past two, three years. And uh, as far as maintaining balance goes. Oh my gosh! How do you balance your life? You know, how do you keep things <laughs> back? How do how do any of us do it? And I think the key is is I think the key is, is is moderation and taking good care of ourselves. Make sure we get enough sleep, eat healthy food. I mean, it's all this stuff that you got told when you were a kid that a lot of us ignored for a long time. But uh, yeah, but yeah, there's a the, the, you have to spend some time and focus, you know, just saying, okay, I got to take care of myself today. You know, it's like, I got to get out and get some exercise done. I got to stretch out a little bit and, you know, make sure that I'm not going to have issues with my back today. You know, I'm, I'm got to, uh, I got to make sure I eat some good food and not eat a whole bunch of cookies, you know, because that'll, that'll make the brain too, too, you know, too right. slow and logy to, to get good writing done. And, you know, just kind of do whatever you can to experience new things. You know, I think that's I think that's one of the key things for me. You know, I, I I've taken up whitewater rafting lately, and uh, I love whitewater rafting. It is so much fun. Uh, nice. I actually went to a 37 degree river without a suit on uh, this spring and had to had to swim out of it. And that 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 was that was really cool. I you know I, I you know I was able to I was able to get out and everything and take care of myself in what could have been a, a dangerous situation. And you know I got done with that. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'm feeling pretty good. I better go right. You know that's sort of, <laughs> <laughs> but uh uh it's 110 degrees in south mississippi today so 37 degree water sounds pretty amazing right now. oh my gosh it, it, yeah yeah it was very it was i was i was about to say it was it was cool but i will say the experience was exhilarating you know <laughs> actually it come out i mean i i got out of the river at just about the same time my legs stopped working you know i had to kind of look down at my feet because i couldn't feel them you know to be able to tell where they were where they were going down on the rocks at the side of the river but uh uh, you know, I kind of got out of that and I was like, yes, I survived. Awesome. You know, that was cool. <laughs> Are there things that you read, watch, listen to that uh, fill the creative well that uh, put back into you when you've poured out so much? Do you, are, are there places you go to kind of, you know, either for your mental health or just out of pure enjoyment, uh, you know, because you, you write stories that bring joy to so many people. There have to be things that, that you like to do just for you that, that don't necessarily have to come out in Dresden files or cinder spires that just, that just Jim loves to do. Yeah. I get online and murder fools in competitive <laughs> video games, you know, uh, 
I play, I, I, I like playing a lot of shooters. I like playing League of Legends. Uh, uh, League of Legends is just like the most savage Darwinian, you know, evolutionary place you could possibly be on the internet. You know, you, I mean, you make a mistake, you hear about it from everyone. And uh, I love getting on there and playing. I, I, I mean, I'm on there as Jim Butcher author. So uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm friends with like a lot of readers and then we'll jump on together and, you know, we'll, we'll chat and, and, and throw smack talk at each other and stuff while we go play. Uh, uh, and I have a good time with that. Um, love it. Uh, I like I like working out a lot. Uh, I go to the gym. I'll put on podcasts or whatever, and and you know, sort of see what's going on in the in in the creative world. You know, listen to a couple different podcasts there while I'm while I'm lifting. Um, uh, uh, I've been doing a lot more endurance training lately. Uh, you know, kind of learning a bit more about that. Um, uh, and you know, I go on walks with my dog. You know, uh, I hang out with my girl. That kind of thing. Love it. Um, I, I did notice uh, a few months ago in, um, you know, in, in, uh, in an email from uh, a, uh, a publisher that your son has uh, a new series uh, out. Uh, what what is that like to, to see your progeny, you know, taking up the family business? Oh, I, I busted out all the buttons on my shirts. I was so happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, my son and I, uh, it was several years ago, I'd offered to teach him to write we, when he was going off to college. And he was like, Dad, I think I'll let the professionals handle that. You know, so <laughs> right. he went off and studied at KU, has a pretty good sci-fi program. He went and studied there for a while. And, and then he came up to me a, a few years after that and was like, you know, um, I think if they could do what you do, they'd be doing that because they seem to be really miserable teaching. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. He said, yeah. He says, do you think you can teach me? I said, sure. And so we started, you know, we started working on stuff and uh, we still get together twice a week and we'll watch, you know, we'll watch with, with the, you know, the latest Star Wars series, you know, the latest Marvel thing on, on Disney and, and we'll watch it and we'll critique it and say, well, how could they have made it better? What well, could have done this, you know, and, and we talk about story and characters and so on, you know, the whole time. And uh, we still do that a couple of times a week, but. You know, he got his first book done, and I think his first book was about as good as my third one, and his second book was about as good as my sixth one, and he's going to leave me eating his dust before too much longer. But uh, he has a, uh, he's been studying for me and Brandon Sanderson, uh, which, you know, I think I had to learn from somebody. I guess Sanderson's okay. You know, that guy. Uh, uh, I, I've been very pleased that he's gone out and, and taken the stuff that I taught him and then gone out and started collecting things from other successful professionals and, and started to put together his own style. And uh, I think he's going to, you know, I've, I've read some of his, some of his other stuff right now. We've got some urban fantasy going and then he's written some you know kind of post-apocalyptic stuff that I think is, that I think is incredible. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does with his career. But uh, yeah, he's going to leave the old man eating dust. I mean, he, he does have the advantage of having been, you know, trained by somebody who was, you know, a New York Times bestselling writer, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, which which was not the same. It's not the same as my experience. I but but at the same time, he he slaved a long time from the time he got his first novel done to the time he got published. I mean, I think it took him about nine years to break in. Wow. Wow. So you know, he's paid his dues. I think he's going to be. He's a solid professional. I think he's going to make a lot of people happy. And that that, that just pleases me to know. It. The, I bet I can't wait to see uh, what's going to come of his career and what is to to come with the Cinder Spires and Dresden Files and the epic epic fantasy series that we know is yeah, coming. Yeah, um, epic epic fantasy. Epic. <laughs> the Olympian Affair, Cinder Spires Book Two, is going to be out this fall, but it's up for pre order now. You can go to Amazon and reserve your copy now. Um, Jim, if if People have been living under a rock and have not been following along with uh, what's going on with Dresden Files and Cinder Spires and Codex Alera and all that great stuff. Is there a place online that is a central repository of all things Jim Butcher where people can get up to speed on everything going on? Yeah, you can go to, to JimButcherOnline.com. Uh, that's my website. You'll be able to find stuff there. Uh, we have Jim Butcher News on Facebook. Uh, you can follow. You can look for me on, on Twitter. Uh, I'm, I'm under, uh, I'm at Longshot Author on Twitter. 
uh, uh, and I'll, I'll announce new stuff coming out and stuff like that there. And occasionally I put up pictures of my dog and stuff like that. You know, my, my social media strategy is my son told me his social media strategy. I think it's brilliant. He says, I'm going to get on social media and all I'm going to do is say thank you. And here's pictures of my dog. And I'm like, that's the most brilliant strategy. <laughs> you know, that is the, that is the best. I think it I'm going to take him. I think I'm going to take, 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 a, take a lead from him. He's, he's sharp. That sounds great. Well, Jim, we're going to link up all of those uh, places where people can find you and where they can pre-order the Olympian Affair in the show notes of this episode. Thank you, as always, for taking time to come on and share with us today. Hank, it was good to talk to you again. I'll see you later.